Hi, I'm Professor Craig Beale from Bucknell University, and this is my video lesson on the Wheatstone Bridge. A Wheatstone Bridge is a device that allows you to make a measurement of an unknown resistance. And you might use this, uh, for example, in an application like uh, application like a strain gauge or a thermistor. And so because these devices require um, some sort of excitation, you have to apply some voltage or current to them uh, in order to get a signal out of the resistance, um, we would ordinarily do this with something like a voltage divider. However, there are some disadvantages to using a voltage divider, um, mostly in terms of being able to separate the signal uh, from the excitation voltage. So we end up using this other construct, which we call the Wheatstone Bridge, where a voltage is applied to two corners of this diamond-shaped pattern of resistors, and then we take the, uh, a voltage reading from the nodes at the two opposite corners. And the voltage across this bridge represents uh, something to do with an unknown resistance. And so if we were, for example, to take R2 as an unknown resistance, we could calculate its resistance uh, using the voltage across the diagonal nodes, as well as the known resistances R1, R3, and R4 in this case. A Wheatstone bridge works in one of two methods. The first method is to take a static balance of the Wheatstone bridge, that is to, to balance out all the resistances. And so the way that you do this is you recognize that the there are two branches of the Wheatstone bridge, the first branch being through R1 and R2, which will assume again that R2 is our unknown resistance. And then the other path is through R3 and R4. And the voltage that we measure then is the voltage across from this node to this node. And so when the Wheatstone bridge is purely in balance, there is actually a zero voltage across here. And that means that the voltage dividers R3 and R4 and R1 and R2 um, have the same ratios, um, R3 and R1 and R2 and R4. And so we can take that as our basic equation here and say that <clears throat> when we're in balance, the ratio R1, R2 over R1 has to be the same as R4 over R3. And so if we know uh, that we've nulled out the bridge so that there's zero voltage across the, the measurement, and we can somehow find the resistances R3, R4, and R1, then we can back calculate R2. That's a relatively simple problem. Um, the way that this is commonly done is using some sort of a variable resistance box where it is possible to bring this unknown circuit or unknown resistance R1 through the box where you can adjust the resistance and in very, very small increments, um, usually in decades. So you can do, you know, um, single digit changes, um, tens of, of ohms changes, hundreds of ohms changes um, by turning a bunch of dials. You can get the exact resistance of R1 that causes the bridge to be balanced and then back, back calculate R2. The other mode of operation for a Wheatstone bridge is what we would refer to as an unbalanced or dynamic mode. In this mode, you set the resistors. So R1, R3, and R4 are the known resistors uh, using some sort of high precision resistor that you can precisely know the value of, um, or measuring them before you start so that you have a, a really good measurement of them. And then you allow R2 to vary with the environment. When you do this, you're going to result in some sort of voltage that's non-zero across the V-out terminals. And we can write the equation for this 
basically just using the difference between the two voltage dividers. Remember that R3, R4 um, provides a voltage divider. R1, R2 acts as a voltage divider. And since we use a high impedance measurement for V out, there's no current that flows between these two. And so the voltage drop across R3, R4 and R1, R2 uh, is the same in total. And so the V out is just the, uh, the differential voltage between the two junctions and the two voltage dividers. We can do that and write the equation. And so we end up with V out is equal to Vs, the source voltage, right, times the product um, R4 over R4 plus R3, which is just the voltage at this node here, right, which is R4 over the total resistance here. This is the standard voltage divider equation that gives us the voltage at this node. And then we have um, R2, so the voltage across this resistor over the total resistance of this current path. And I have the signs backward here. Um, you don't know which way this is going to go, um, but as I have it written here, um, we would imagine that we would get a plus sign on this side and a minus sign on this side, um, assuming a, a change in R2 in the positive direction. Now you'll notice that if we choose these resistors, R1, R3, R4, to all be the same as R2, then the nominal output of this circuit is going to be zero across V out. And so we can balance the Wheatstone bridge initially before we start to load it. And so we have a zero reference point and that will be important later. Let's talk a little bit about why you would choose to use a Wheatstone bridge over the voltage divider circuit that I showed earlier. The first reason is that a balanced bridge, if you're gonna use the, uh, the resistance, the unknown resistance mode and keep the bridge balanced, if V out ends up being zero right here, and you end up using this relationship that R3 over R4 is equal to R1 over R2 to solve this, you'll note that Vs does not appear anywhere in this equation. And so regardless of the voltage that you provide to the circuit, the Wheatstone bridge is going to provide you with a resistance measurement of your unknown resistor that's totally independent of this voltage. And so if you have a voltage that happens to be a little bit unstable or you don't know exactly what Vs is, uh, this is a nice advantage. Another advantage of the Wheatstone bridge is that you can take into account the temperature effects on the sensor and as well, you can take into account, into account the temperature effects and the nominal resistances of the lead wires that lead out to your particular location where you're measuring. And so you do this uh, as I've drawn in these two circuits. Uh, these are two examples of how you might do this. Your instrumentation might be located in one uh, location and your experiment might actually be located in a different spot. And so we can draw a little bounding box here for each one of these things. So your measurement is out here in your A to D system and whatever you're using to record this uh, is located back here. And you have these long lead wires in between. And so one way to combat this and not have uh, the lead wires change your measurements is to make it so that your lead wires between the end of the resistors are the same length. That way they'll have the same resistance and it doesn't throw off the ratio. Um, and then you can also um, make sure that those lead wires to the best of your ability experience the same environment. By experiencing the same environment, they'll have the same temperature effect and therefore, again, the ratio will be preserved. And notice that you have to run a third lead wire out here and take your measurement of V out off of the node um, right where um, 
the lead wire going from R1 to R2 meets R2. Otherwise, you don't, you're not actually measuring V out at the right location. And the, the actual length of that lead wire and the temperature effects on that lead wire um, are relatively insignificant because that's not a, a current path, um, but you have to run the wire out there to get the measurement in the right location nonetheless. Another way that you can do this, um, as I've marked or drawn out below here, uh, is to actually put both of the sensors in the, uh, the measurement portion of the bridge, if we're assuming R2 is the unknown resistor, uh, you put both of those resistances into the, uh, the measurement environment. And in some cases, this is done with a dummy gauge, if it's possible. So for example, strain gauges, uh, you want to measure physical strain, but they have a temperature sensitivity. And so by putting two strain gauges in the same environment, one strain gauge as a dummy that's unstressed, but it still experiences the same temperature, and the other gauge, which experiences the temperature and is stressed, uh, you're compensating for the temperature effects on uh, R2 by having R1 in an unstressed state in the same temperature. Um, and so you can do something like this. Um, you can use it, obviously, in lots of different applications, except for something like a thermistor where it's going to be temperature sensitive itself. And again, I've got, you'll see that I have the same length lead wires going from node to node and connecting the resistances. The last and possibly most important aspect of the Wheatstone bridge is the ability of the bridge to produce a differential signal that we can measure with an external device. So we'll look at a contrast between the voltage divider and the Wheatstone bridge in this example. So with the voltage divider, if we take a look at the equation, we have that V out is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 times the source voltage. And so if we choose a, resist, a set of resistors that are relatively balanced, uh, so say the nominal resistance of R2 is somewhere around 1000 ohms, we'll then choose R1 to be equal to a thousand ohms as well. And when we do this, what we're going to find is that when R2 is exactly a thousand ohms, and so basically when this thing is, is at its nominal position, we end up with V out in the zero condition, we'll call that, is equal to 2.5 volts. So now let's say that we take um, R2 and we change our sensor so that we get uh, 990 ohms. And so now we want to know what V out is. So V out is going to equal 990 over 1990 ohms times RVS, so I'm assuming here five volts, and we end up with something like, uh, this ends up being 0 0.497 times five volts. So something very, very, very close to the actual value uh, five volts. So we're going to say this is a, or approximately half of 5 volts. So this is going to be approximately 2.5 volts with about a 0.3% change. Uh, if we look at this 0.497, about a 0.3% change from the nominal value. Now we're going to contrast this with the Wheatstone bridge. So the Wheatstone bridge equation we're going to have that V out is equal to R3 over R3 plus R4 minus R2 over R1 plus R2 times, again, the V source. Now, when this thing is balanced, we'll use the exact same 
values here. So we're gonna say that R2 is approximately a thousand ohms, but then it's gonna vary as we load it. And then we're gonna say R1 is equal to R3 is equal to R4 is equal to a thousand ohms. And so we'll assume that this is all at you know, nice precision. And so this implies that in the zero condition, we actually get zero volts since R2 um, is going to be exactly half of R1 plus R2 and R3 is going to be exactly half of R3 plus R4. You have one half minus one half uh, and you have zero times Vs. And it doesn't matter what your source voltage is, you're gonna get zero no matter what. So then we can take our uh, second case here so where R2 is equal to 900, oops, 990 ohms, and we can calculate this. So V out is going to be equal to, again, if our R3 and R4 are precision resistors, we're gonna get hopefully something very close to 0 0.5. And then we're going to get our 990 ohms over 1000 ohms plus 990 ohms times our five volt source. And we're gonna end up with something like, again, um, we're gonna get 0 0.003 times five volts. Now notice this is just the point is, um, 0.5, so the one half nominal value of the, the R2 and R1 voltage divider um, minus the 0.497 that we came up with in the previous problem. But now this is going to be something small and so 0.015 volts. Now this is a small signal all right, so we're talking about something in on the order of millivolts, but we're comparing it to zero volts. So this is something that we could amplify and say, okay, well, we've seen some sort of substantial change from zero. Whereas over on the voltage divider, we now have something like 2.5 volts. And over here, I didn't calculate this value. If I real quickly do that, we're gonna get five, five times 0.497. This is going to be 2.485. And so we're gonna to have to subtract 2.5 from 2.485, except for the fact that we don't have that reading available when we're taking the reading uh, with the loaded signal. So we can't actually do this in hardware. We would have to assume that Vs stays stable the whole time and that um, our nominal output point V out zero that we're gonna subtract away from our reading is actually remaining the same. If it varies, it's gonna cause error in our reading. On the other hand, we have our Wheatstone bridge where we've always got this reference being formed on the, the non-loaded side, and then we're comparing it with the, the sensor, and as a result, we're forming the reference at the same time we're doing this actually in hardware, um, and we have a signal that is affected by the source voltage, but uh, is being, the reference is being taken into account. And then our, our zero voltage uh, reference is being taken into account at all times. And so therefore, we're less prone to error. The other benefit of doing this is that we are also able to take this and amplify it. Since we have a signal, this 0 0.015 volts is a small signal, um, but we don't have to subtract anything from it. We can take that, run it through some sort of amplifier and get a much larger signal out of it, whereas we would not be able to do that with uh, the voltage divider circuit.